Have you ever tried to open a door and above the handle it says push, but you pull, then you read the text and you feel like an idiot? One of the biggest reasons for this happening is bad design and it's not your fault. The door handle is a signifier that you should pull it. So even if it does say push, the handle has already told you to do the opposite. And so you do. This is why some push doors have removed the handle altogether. This is one of the most common introductions to human-computer interaction, and we're going to talk about how it relates to games and game art. Game art is a means to communicate information. My last video covered how the design of your enemies can affect gameplay. In this video, we'll cover how game art affects platforming. So let's start with how your art can confuse the player in terms of where to go. We'll start with Hoa. Hopefully you haven't seen this game, so you can experience the confusion that I experienced. We will start up here, then jump down and continue going forward. We try to jump up, and we can't. The path is blocked. So we walk back and there's just another wall. There's nowhere to go. Except this isn't a wall. We can just keep going. So let's compare. This side with a collision looks like this. And this side without any collision looks like this. They look exactly the same. So we're starting with the most blatant error I think you can make. Giving the player an example of something that you can't go through. And then have other objects that look identical but that you can go through. The player might not even try and run into this wall because they've already assumed that it can't be walked through because in their head they've tried it once before. The easiest way to fix this is to just change the design so that they look different. Different design for different rules. But I want to go one step further and show how a game that does this well utilizes their design to make the player discover a secret path. So let's look at Rayman. Similar situation. We're up here and there's nothing really down below, but you have these cool small things. So you go down and check on them, and oh, there's a hidden place here. In Hoa, they had a place where you needed to go, and then they hid it. Whereas in Rayman, they had a hidden place, but made you accidentally discover it. So if Hoa for some reason didn't want to redesign this rock, they still could have placed something there to force you to explore it. Guiding your player with your game art is really non-intrusive and often feels more immersive than having an arrow telling you where to go. So if possible, I recommend that you try it out. I want us to take this aspect one step further. If the player ever misses a path, it can very quickly make them think that they missed something, which can easily make them backtrack and waste 40 minutes looking for an alternative route that doesn't exist. So being clear and showing possible paths can really help reduce the risk of this happening. So let's look at Celeste. It's a precision platformer, and you can die from hitting these spikes or falling down these pits. But think of the problem that this introduces. If you die by falling down a pit, how do you make the player willingly jump down a path that leads to a new room? The solution used in Celeste and many other games is to add a light down the pit. So for any path that kills you, there's no light. But for paths that lead to a new room, there's a light. This is partly good because it helps distinguish between a place that kills you and a potential path. But this type of light is also helpful to signal any path that the player might otherwise miss. And we can see that Celeste even uses it for a path that goes upwards. It demands attention and it makes you curious to check it out. In this case, a really distinct light might not fit your style. But you can solve it other ways as well. You could easily add visual indicators working as breadcrumbs showing you possible paths. Similarly, most games have platforms that you can climb down, like this one in Dead Cells or this one in Guacamole. Having this thin platform and then what looks like a path clearly signifies that you can jump down somehow, which is why it can be so frustrating when you encounter a situation like this one in Dust, where the platform that you can jump down is so thick that it looks like any other normal platform. It could easily make you miss the intended path, and we're back to wasting time and potentially getting annoyed at the game. It's what I would say if it wasn't for the fact that Dust knows that they communicate this poorly. And so the first time you encounter it, it explicitly tells you that you can use S and space to jump down. But it's very much possible that you might forget that you can jump down these assets. And so Dust just keeps reminding you. For every type of asset that you can jump down, you get a pop-up saying, you can jump down this asset. It can be fine to have poor affordance if you think that it fits some other grand narrative, but please be aware that this causes confusion and you need to mitigate it somehow. We don't need to fix everything with our art. It can be fine to have text. So we've talked about how art communicates information. And in essence, a lot of what we're talking about is affordance. Affordance is a term that kind of describes how the look of something tells you how to interact with it. You don't need a label or instruction to tell you how to use it. The design tells you how to use it. This goes back to the door example. The door handle works as a signifier telling the user to pull the door. If you're playing Blasphemous and see this ladder, the shape of it tells you that you can use it to climb down. And sure enough, you can. But if we look at this scene in Dust, where you have this ladder, the shape still tells you that you can use it to climb down. Except this ladder is just part of the background. And so you might try and use it and it becomes a form of miscommunication. There are plenty more examples of affordance in games. We have levers that you pull, rings that you can hang on, ropes that you can hang and swing on, platforms that you can drag up and down, with clear handles and rails showing you the direction in which they will go. When you have an object that you need to rotate, 
the shape you interact with looks exactly like a steering wheel, which indicates to you that you need to rotate it. Even other games borrow similar things from the real world, such as this knot in Iconoclast, or in Celeste where you have this spring platform, which signifies to you that you can jump on it. Similarly, we have gaming tropes for how to interact with objects. They are signifiers that are so commonly used that any experienced player knows what is being communicated. For instance, if you want to show that the wall is breakable, add cracks in it. And if you want to take this one step further, you can do it like in Iconoclast and make the cracked rock also blink. If you're unsure if the player understands that the object is interactable, feel free to make it extra explicit. If you want to show crumbling platforms, this implementation in Eternal Noctis is significantly more blatant than this one in Ori. Which type of implementation you want to do is up to you. In Ori, it might not be super clear that this will break, but you'll also figure it out quite quickly. Just make sure that if it's really vital that the player understands something, to make it blatant. Like this place in Hollow Knight, where you enter this empty room, and you walk around and the floor shakes so much that you know that it is breakable. If this wasn't blatant, it would be easy to miss, and you might not ever go back to the place when you finally get the ability to break this floor. And once again, if we feel like we can't communicate this with our game art, just straight up tell the user this is important. Like this place in Dust, where they have this literal cutscene telling you, you can't use this yet, come back. Just be mindful of when clear communication is important and when it isn't. When we don't have any natural affordances that is offered, it is very common to add particle effects to indicate that the object is interactable, and it probes the player to investigate. You don't always need to signify affordance. Sometimes signifying interactability is enough. But suppose this doesn't work and you're out of options. If you know that something you have designed has poor affordance, and you don't want to tell the player explicitly how to interact with the object, you can still force the player to figure it out. For instance, both Rayman and the Messenger have these things that you hang on. They look like literal loops. The player knows that you can hang on them because of the design. But let's look at Rogue Legacy. Instead of a loop, we're supposed to hit this lamp object with our weapon. Clearly, it isn't obvious that a lamp is a means to jump up places. So what have they done to fix that? Before any run, it's the first thing you have to do before progressing into the level. Even if you stop playing for half a year and forgot about the lamp mechanic. You'll remember it soon enough because it's the only path to go. This solution is super common in metroidvanias because whenever you get an upgrade you haven't yet learned how to use it. So games like Ori or Guacamole traps you until you've figured out how to use the ability you just got. This is obviously more of a level design solution to a problem. But my point here is that if we know our game art isn't communicating something well, then we might use level design to complement it. And if our level design causes confusion, then we can use game art to reduce that confusion. It doesn't really matter how we solve our problems, but understanding the weaknesses of our implementation is extremely important. For most of your game art, you will always have to take into account what type of asset you're creating. If you're creating a platforming asset or a background asset, and you generally don't want to confuse the two. In Hoa, this vine is walkable. This other one isn't, but they look exactly the same. It does add moss on the top, signaling that maybe you can walk there but then it breaks that on this other end. I'm generally against this type of completion and prefer to break the shape of the thing to better indicate that it is a platforming asset. For instance, when I make a tree platform, I would make the leaves a square shape to better indicate that it is a platform. And we can compare that to background trees, which are significantly more rounded. If the shape of the object doesn't inform the player clearly enough that an object is walkable, a very common solution is to add a signifier to indicate that it is walkable, or to sort of color code your platforms. For instance, you might have a tree like this, and you want the player to jump on the branches. But if the branches are just brown, how will the player ever know that the branches have collisions? You add moss, and now it becomes visually distinct and very clear. On top of that, I think that this can be a good way to improve readability as well. For instance, Jump King uses collision signifiers all the time, even though the shapes themselves communicate where the platforms are. It just reads better and feels more comfortable to play. You don't have to think or process, it's just there. To end with, I'm gonna mention a level design issue that bugs me a lot. In Hoa, I got down this small path. Kind of cute environment. I get to this place, and unless I forgot about an ability that I'm supposed to have, this jump feels weird. It's just on the cusp of making you think that you can reach it with a double jump. But five minutes trying, I still didn't manage to do it. Compare that to Hollow Knight, where you encounter this platform before you have gotten the double jump, and you're nowhere close to reaching it. So you'll stop trying and continue moving elsewhere quite quickly. As I said, this is a level design example, but it can even apply to game art. Try and avoid ambiguity as much as possible. Ambiguity can easily make the player stuck on trying to do something that is impossible to do. And as I mentioned in my last video, you might not know where you communicate poorly or where there is ambiguity in your game. And because of that, it can be really helpful to do some user testing. Let someone else play your game and watch them get confused. Don't just ask them what to think. Take note of misplays that arise due to bad communication. If you know that you have a task 
task that the player needs to learn and perform, like picking up a weapon. You can even tell the user, can you pick up this weapon and then sell it, and see if they can manage that instruction, without you informing them how they do it. Just see if they can figure it out themselves. If they can, you know that you communicate quite clearly in your game. And if they can't, you need to figure out how to make it more explicit. If you want to watch my other two videos on how game art relates to combat or UI interaction, you can click on either of these two videos. Thanks for watching. Bye.